we had a very difficult message last week, didn't we? We talked about suffering and how uh, there are things that we can give to God in heaven, our, our praises, uh, our crowns, we can cast before him our love. But there are other things we can't do for God in heaven. Did you know that God has called us to be ambassadors of heaven, to be his witnesses to a, to a world that is confused or in doubt or angry and rejecting the Lord? So many people, the majority of people around us, are not in a love relationship with Jesus Christ. So many people, the majority of people around us, uh, are sleepwalking into hell. And the reason I said sleepwalking is because the percent of people that is willfully angry and shaking their fist at God like a, a militant atheist is, is actually very few. But a lot of people are just dazed and going through life, the same old, same old, waking up, going to work, coming home, and they're not thinking about eternal things, and they're sleepwalking their way right into eternal damnation. Brothers and sisters, we cannot, in heaven, we cannot evangelize. You're not going to be able to talk to people about Jesus and help pray with them and bring them to become Christians in heaven. Why? Everybody in heaven is already a Christian, right? Everybody in heaven is already a believer in Jesus Christ. That was, that was a softball, guys. That was not one of those hard questions. Uh, so you're not going to be able to do that in heaven. And we said there's another thing you're not going to be able to do. Jesus Christ said, pick up your cross. This painful, this agony, this hardship, this loneliness, this bitterness, pick it up. Don't reject it. Carry it. And in doing so, we glorify the Lord. And right now, everybody on this planet suffers. You don't have, you know, everybody suffers. Everybody has hard and difficult times. Does anybody doubt that? I mean, I should be preaching something easy to understand right now, right? Everybody deals with hardship. Now, either you do it with Jesus or you do it lonely, all by yourself. And either you're in that hospital bed with the bad news and you're facing the end and you are mean and ornery to all the nurses around you. You're mean and ornery to your family. You say hurtful things because you're on your way out and you want to give them a zinger. Or you just pout and you cry and it's all about feelings. I'm not saying you can't cry, <laughs> but I'm talking about this life that's wrapped up in, oh, woe is me. Either you're going to suffer and just feel miserable for yourself and make other people around you miserable, or you are going to go through your suffering because you know it's just a short while more, just a little while more, and I'm in glory, and I'm going to bless everybody around me, and I want to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ from this hospital bed, from the middle of this relational pain, from my financial troubles. Wherever I am, I want to shine Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we carry our cross and our pain can actually glorify God. So what's it going to be? Jesus says, pick up your cross. Follow me. Let's look back, uh, Matthew chapter 16 from verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. No to Dan. Uh, put your own name in that. We got three Dan's here, and all three of us are thinking, what? Why me? You know? Uh, no to yourself. If you ever do that? You feel like you want to go on a big, good pity party, or you're getting angry, and you know if you pray, God's going to deal with your anger issues, so you don't want to pray. But you say no to yourself. You say no to your flesh. Have you been there? There's a temptation. And you say, Lord God, I'm supposed to say no to myself and yes to you. And then Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever wishes to lose his life for my sake, he's going to find it. For what will it profit a man? What benefit is it? What benefit is it if you get that raise? What benefit is it if you get that recognition in the workplace? What benefit is it if you're the most popular kid in school? What benefit is it if you gain the whole world and you forfeit your very soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And we said whatever 
whatever is distracting us, whatever is, is pulling us away from God, that's the price. That's the price the devil's paying you for your soul. For the Son of Man is going to come in glory, in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then will repay every man according to his deeds. Listen to this. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let me word that a different way. Some who are standing here will actually get to see me in my glory before they die. With that in mind, let's read in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, uh, 1 through 13. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. So Jesus just said, there's going to be a few of you that are actually going to see me glorified before you have to die. Because when we all die, we get to see God in his glory. We get to see Jesus Christ. So he takes Peter, James, and John. This is six days later. You know, there's a funny thing. Uh, Mark says six days. Uh, Matthew says six days. Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says it was about eight days. He doesn't say it was eight days. He says it was about eight days. That is one of the funniest things. But uh, anyways, it, yeah, it was about eight days. It was six days. So after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on this high mountain. So in Scripture in the Old Testament, remember you had Moses. He went up on the mountain uh, to receive from God. You had Elijah go up on the mountain and, and hear from the, the living God. So they're going up on the mountain. They're, this is symbolic of going up towards God. There, Jesus was transfigured. And the word transfigured is where we get our English word uh, metamorphosis. He was, he was morphosized or something. He, he was just a uh, metamorphosist. What am I looking for? Metamorph metamorphed, metamorphosized, yes. He was transfigured. That's a good word. Uh, he was transfigured uh, before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. So you're sitting in that first century church, and you're hearing, maybe you didn't hear about this story, and you were thinking, wow. Wow. Jesus Christ glorified right in front of them, right in front of these apostles. Jesus Christ is changed, and his glory shines out from within him. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as bright as as white as the light. Some people think this maybe even occurred at nighttime. So imagine, as bright as the sun, suddenly just gle gle gleaming out from in front of them. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So the two men that went up on the mountain in the Old Testament are there. Uh, some scholars think Moses was, was kind of a symbol of all the believers who have had to die, and they went to heaven. In Elijah is kind of representing guys like Enoch who just went up to the Lord. They didn't have to die. And every believer will be alive when Jesus Christ comes back again. They won't have to die to see the glorified selves. You see, you have Moses and Elijah. Guys, guess what? They're not angels. You ever hear that? You see it on TV? You die and you get your wings? You don't. This is Moses and Elijah and they're guys, but they're glorified. They're in their glorified bodies and this is a wonderful situation. They're, they're, and you know what else? How do they know this is Moses and Elijah? Because they had big beards? Because they look like Charlton Heston? I don't know. I wonder if our, if our new bodies, because when we're in heaven, we're made new. There's no more sickness. There's no more death. The Bible says we're, we're godlike. I wonder if our new bodies are so powerful and so forceful, you just know who people are. You see them in heaven and and you just know. And they saw, and they said, that's Moses. And, and that's Elijah. Right now, we're just a shadow. I mean, we're going to shine. We're just a shadow of who we will be. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you now Peter's the guy who just, you know, said, you're the rock. I mean, not the rock. Jesus said him, you're the rock. He said, you are the son of the living God. And now he says, Lord, it's so good for us to be here. If you wish, we're going to put up three shelters or tabernacles or shrines. This is for, uh, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So he's saying, Moses, Elijah, Jesus, 
so you can celebrate the uh, Festival of Tabernacles, right? Well, that's not right. You don't put Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah. And so while he was speaking, a bright cloud covered them, enveloped them, the glory of the Lord, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And I, Peter, God a divine, hey, listen to him. Brothers and sisters, how many times has God had to say, come on, wake up, listen. Listen, pay attention to what's going on. While they were still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Uh, God giving divine confirmation. This one is different than Moses and Elijah. This one is my son. And I'm so pleased with everything he's doing. You guys got to listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground terrified. Probably two things are going on there. One, in the Old Testament, when you were worshiping, when you were in reverence and awe, you fell on your face. You just like totally prostrated yourself. This is, this is God. But the second thing is they were just scared. They were scared out of their wits. They're just collapsing. Whoa, what just happened there? They fall face down on the ground. They realize we were wrong to equate Jesus with a mere prophet. Uh, so they fall face down on, on the ground after God said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus, so Moses and Elijah are gone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So Jesus Christ was on a plan. He was on a schedule. Uh, He was going to be crucified when he wanted to. Uh, in order to, to maximize the most people in, in Jerusalem at, uh, at that time, right when his ministry had been completed. And so he's, he's telling them, this is not the time. This is not the time for that. So the disciples asked him, why then did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? So in the Old Testament, there was this prophecy that Elijah is going to come back before the great, uh, terrible day of the Lord. And Elijah was going to bring uh, turn the hearts of the children to their dads. And he was going to turn the hearts of the dads to the children. And he was going to bring God's people together. Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they didn't recognize him. But they have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man, he's returning, referring to what uh, this phrase comes from the book of Daniel. So this is also an Old Testament allusion. Uh, The Son of Man was this divine figure that spoke with the prophet Daniel. Uh, The Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. So again, he's talking suffering, suffering. So he went up on the mountain. He's glorified. He's coming down from the mountain. He's talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about the suffering that awaits him. Then his disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. He came uh, to represent. He filled the role of Elijah to call the people back to to Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyone want to take a guess? I'm sure you could get it. You know, the Old Testament is full of all that judgment, condemnation, wrath of God stuff. So you'll probably get this. This is easy. Um, Which person in the Bible teaches about hell more than any other person? You got it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, Jesus loves us. Have you ever heard somebody say that if you love me, you wouldn't talk to me about hell? I, I've heard that many times, haven't you? Pe- people say, well, if you, if you loved the, the, the culture, you would never talk to them about hell. Well, Jesus Christ loved this world enough to lay down his life, to leave glory, to leave heaven, step down from his throne, give up all the rights and privileges of godhood, get spit on, get mocked, mistreated, beaten, cruelly, so disfigured the Old Testament said you could hardly recognize him as a human being. 
hammered and nailed to a cross to take responsibility for every rotten thing that we've ever done. Listen, he took responsibility for the things that every rotten thing you ever did before you knew better. And on that cross, he took responsibility for every nasty, foolish, wicked, evil thing you've ever done since you became a Christian and you knew better. He took responsibility for it all. And on the cross, it was all dumped on him. Every vile thing I've ever thought and said and done, every wicked thing, this, this group is everywhere in the world. It was all poured on him, and he took it. Who loves us more than Jesus Christ? The answer, obviously, is nobody. Nobody has given up more for people less deserving. And yet, he talks to us about hell all the time. And God, the Father, says, this is my son. I'm so pleased with him. Pleased with the fact that he was born in this fallen world. He came down and born in a manger, born in poor, meek circumstances. So pleased that he's been living a sinless life. So pleased that he's been going around with this message. So pleased that he, he was rejected and yet he loves. So pleased because God knows he will be mocked and tortured severely mistreated he will be rejected by the people he loves and yet he's going to suffer and die for our sins and God says I'm pleased with him and Jesus Christ is warning everybody the kingdom of heaven is at hand repent you got to make that u-turn remember that's what repentance is because there's a hell and there's a heaven and Jesus Christ is preaching this message of He's a brimstone, fire and brimstone message. Jesus Christ is preaching about hell, and God says, I'm pleased with his message. I'm pleased with what he's doing. Okay, again, why do we harp on this? Because the Bible is difficult. The Bible, and we've, we go through it slowly, and one of the reasons we do it, well, we go through it mainly because we want to see the heart of God. Another reason we do this is because I don't want to be open to accusation that I just hit the hard parts and skip the fun stuff. We're going through bit by bit by bit, and guess what? Jesus, the Lamb of God, warns about hell more than anybody else, and God says, I approve. I approve. Why is it today? And is it a warning bell? Are you sitting in a church, in a congregation? We hardly ever hear about hell. And it's almost like people apologize for the doctrine of hell. God forbid if that's the message that Jesus Christ bought, brought, if that's the message of Scripture, then when we share Jesus Christ, are we doing a disservice to God if we never talk about hell? Jesus declared divine by God up on that mountain everything Jesus is about coming to earth suffering, being mocked heading to the cross, the resurrection getting a big thumbs up from God the difficult messages we see Christ giving again and again not the things that the human race wants to hear, right? the things that God wants us to hear how many of the Old Testament prophets were really, really popular and well-liked? Jesus said, which of the prophets didn't, <laughs> were, were well-received? Our goal is not to be popular. Our goal is to hold out eternal life, the cross of Jesus Christ. Because we want to love people enough to tell them difficult truth. If I just comfort people on their way to hell... What's wrong with me? We get tired of it. It's not PC. And the Father says, listen to him. Brothers and sisters, listen to Jesus Christ. Listen to the message that we have in this. What did Paul say? He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is, because it is the power of it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, the Jew and the Gentile. 
Heaven's a real place. The doors are wide open. The gospel has the power of salvation. And everybody can have eternal life if they would come to God in faith. What is it that Christ says right after, uh, right after this? It's, it really, really blessed me. gave me a new insight in the heart of our Savior. Remember what I said uh, when we started this study of Matthew? The goal is to love Jesus more than ever before. We're going to see Jesus as he really is, the real Jesus. And so I want us to look at this situation again. Let's go slowly, okay? Uh, Jesus. You say you love Jesus, right? You're a Christian. Every Christian says, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Jesus went up on this mountain, taking a, this core group of disciples with him. He gets up on this mountain. He's bathed in this white light. His face changes. His clothes just radiate this glory of God. The one who loves you, the, the Lamb of God who has sacrificed for your sins, the gentle shepherd who, who carries his sheep in his arms, he's radiating. He's God. This is God in human flesh. Moses and Elijah are just talking with him. Did you ever think about that? In heaven, there's God on his throne, right? And he's always on his throne. And the, and the living creatures, the angels around him are saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. God is holy. He's awesome in power. <clears throat> he's majestic. He's high and lifted up. There's nothing like God. Even a sinless angels, they have to cover their eyes from his glory. And here's God in flesh standing conversing with Moses and Elijah. Well, one thing, you go to heaven, you're not, we're not, when we die, we're not dead and we wait for God. You, go to he you die, you go to heaven if you're a believer. And you're not an angel. See, we're seeing things about heaven here. And Moses and Elijah are having a conversation. They're chatting with Jesus Christ. This is wonderful. In heaven, the one who has the nail-scarred hands, the one who gave everything for you, we're going to be able to talk with him. Not just over there on some awesome throne. He talks to his people face to face. This passage uh, blows me away. Luke tells us that he was, he was talking to them about, they were talking with him about the cross. So it's, it's still a, a ways to go, to go in his ministry but here he's been transfigured, and Moses and Elijah are there, and it's coming. Everybody knows it's coming. All three of them know it's coming. He's going to the cross, talking about what he came. He came to die so that you and I could have eternal life. What a beautiful, beautiful picture here. God in flesh talking with Moses and Elijah about how he's going to die so that you and I can also go to heaven and talk with him. Remember God bringing us into the fellowship of the Trinity. God loves us and he wants to talk with us. Jesus wants to talk with you. Well, maybe Jesus didn't know about Moses' sins. Maybe he didn't know about how Elijah just wanted to pray and die. He said, I give up. No. This is, Jesus took care of all the sins on the cross. Jesus loves you. And he wants to chat. You know when it says in, in uh, Revelation, Jesus is knocking on the door. He says, let me in. I want to dine with you and you with me. Let's sup together. Well, we know what Jesus brings to the table. He brings his blood. He brings his body. He brings eternal life. He brings forgiveness. He brings acceptance. What do we bring to the table? Oh, Lord, I'm broken. I don't know how I can go on. Lord, I'm so sick of myself. Lord, I, how come I mess up? How come I mess up every relationship I'm in? God, I, I just, I'm so hard on people. Lord God, I'm so afraid. I'm afraid to die. I know it's heavens, I know it, but I'm afraid of the pain. We bring this to the table, and he brings, come here. It's going to be okay to the table. God knows. God knows. Then Peter, again, the same guy that just a few days earlier, about eight days, 
uh, a few days earlier, had correctly identified Jesus as the Son of God. Now Peter wants to put up three shrines, three tabernacles, you know, Elijah and Moses and, and Jesus, and, and God steps in to defend his son. He said, this is my son, this one. I'm so pleased with him. Don't you love God the Father saying he's so pleased with God the Son? This is the heart of our Heavenly Father. God the Father saying he's so pleased with God's son. And then he says, and he didn't say to just Peter, James, and John. He's saying to every one of us in this room, listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Listen to what he has to say. Uh, God puts an end to this business of, of three shrines, three tabernacles. While Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground and were terrified. And then look at what happens next. And I love this, this passage. There, there's little pieces in Scripture that tell us so much about the God we worship. What God do you worship? He's high and lifted up, right? He's exalted. The angels of heaven glorifying Him all time. Jesus came to them. What? Jesus came to them? Why does the higher go to the lower? Jesus came to them. He walked over to them. I don't have to walk over there. They should walk to me. Jesus came to them and he touched them. Come on, guys. Each one of them on their shoulder. Come on. Get up. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Get up. Stand for Jesus Christ. What a Lord we have. When you're down and you're terrified, God himself coming. What a wonderful, wonderful God we have. From Jacob to Elijah to Daniel, we have a God. We see angels or even God himself physically placing a hand of encouragement on people like you and me. Remember Elijah? God cooked for him. And it said it was warm bread. And after the resurrection, and the disciples they see Jesus, and they're, over, they're so overwhelmed, they're so excited to see Jesus. They're out fishing, he's on the shore. And what's Jesus doing there? Cooking them a warm meal. Fish. God, the high and mighty, saying, I think you need a meal. I think you need some warm food. What kind of, what kind of insanity is this? What kind of a religion is this? God wants to spend time with you. God wants to, you to walk in step with his Holy Spirit. God wants to walk just like he walked with Adam in the cool of the day. He wants to go through life with us. Let's eat together. Let's walk together. Let's sing together. Let's live together. You're afraid? Let's do that together. You're angry? Let's work on that together. That's sin, we're going to fix that together. Okay, I'll follow this, God. You with me? You with me? Is this a God you want to follow? Yes? Well, who, who else would you follow like that? Just think about that. If God... Uh, just sat up on that throne all by himself, glorious, majestic, he would still be worthy of all our loyalty. He'd be worthy of all our praise. He'd give him everything. He's the creator. He's the master of the universe. He's, he's the, the king of kings, the lord of lords. He's the mightiest one. But a God who gets up out of that throne, descends down that dais, descends down the staircase. A God who puts his hand on your shoulder and you look over and there's nail wounds, there's nail scarred hands. He puts his hands on your shoulders and he takes your hand and says, okay, life is hard, I know it. You need some warm bread. <laughs> Get up. And he lifts us up. 
A God like that, what does he deserve? Everything and more. More than we could ever give him. That's a God we would follow to the, to the gates of hell. That's a God who said, pick up your cross, endure this hardship for me, show, show my glory as you go through this hard time. You say, okay, because you love me. Okay, because you're so good. When we're face down on the ground and life is terrified, we're terrified out of our minds. And guess what? Sometimes we're terrified out of our minds. The storms of life, the rumble, the shake, everything falling apart all around us like an earthquake. Finances ruined, health ruined, and it looks like this time we're not going to bounce back. And God puts his hand on you and says, get up. Don't be afraid. Because why? Because why? Because he's with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. So, brothers and sisters, what scares you? Something scares everybody. Relationships? Money? Money issues? Health? Health of the people you love? Scared me seeing dad on the ground terrified me. All of the above? <laughs> Get up. Don't be afraid. And look what it says in Matthew 17, 8. Matthew 17, 8. Lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. When I'm down, when I'm beaten up, when life threatens to shut us down, lonely, loneliness is such a horrible thing. Fear, anger. You know, when you're angry at somebody, then you get angry at yourself for being angry. It's a downward spiral. We, threaten, we feel like we're shutting down mentally. We feel like we're shutting down emotionally. And Jesus Christ, we puts his hand on our shoulder and says, get up, don't be afraid. We need to stop fixating on our fears. We need to look where? We need to look up and see Jesus Christ alone. If you continue to focus on all the things wrong in your life, you will dwell in misery. We need to, God says, now listen to my son. And his son said, get up, don't be afraid. In looking up, they saw only Jesus. What are you seeing today? List of hardships. What are you seeing today? List of disappointments. What are you seeing today? Betrayal and people who've let me down. What do you see today? People disrespect me. Nobody loves me enough. Nobody cares. What are you seeing today, brothers and sisters? Don't be afraid. Stop fixating on that. Look up. Look away from the disaster around us. Look up. And see Jesus Christ alone. Because only Jesus is the Savior. He's the Savior because he saves us from, from all of this. We have a God. We have a God who sees us in our filth, in our wretchedness. He sees a world that's full of divorce and full of, full of uh, torture and pain and hardship and war and chaos in, in, in people living just for themselves and people taking advantage of other people for, a, for the almighty dollar. And God looks at all that and he says, I'm going to get my hands dirty. I'm going to get off of this throne. He steps down. He goes into the nastiness of real life. He says, I'm going to take responsibility for all your sins. He pays for our sins with his own perfect life. Then he reaches out to us with the wounds still in his hands to show us how much he loves us, how much he cares, and says, okay, time to get up. There's nothing for you down in that mire. There's nothing, there's nothing working for you down in that mud. Get up. God says, listen to him. He says, get up, don't be afraid. And looking up, we see only Jesus Christ. Are you physically sick? This morning, you know what's worse? Being sick at heart. Are you sick at heart? 
struggling with that? Are you scared? Fearful of an unknown future? Or how about being feared of a known future? You've got, a, you've got something horrible to tackle. You don't want to go through it. But you have to. Do you feel terribly alone? Or just fed up with life, fed up with people? Maybe fed up with yourself as well? Let Jesus touch you. You may be ashamed. How could a perfect holy God touch me? How could a perfect holy God care for me? You know, let him deal with that. And he already did on the cross. All those terrible things that we're ashamed of, those wicked, ungodly things that you've said and done and the thoughts that you've allowed to roam and hold sway in your head, the way we fall so far short of God's glory, don't let those things hold you back. Do not let them hold you back. It's the devil who is the accuser of the brethren. The devil will say you're not good enough to be in church. The devil will say you're not good enough yet to be a Christian. You need to get better. The devil will say you don't belong. Don't buy what the devil's selling. Jesus died for you so that you could live with him. God wants to be with you. So anything telling you that you shouldn't be with him, that's a lie. And Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Jesus Christ is right here, right now, today. Boy, I hope he's pleased with what we're doing this morning, don't you? Jesus Christ is right here. He's sitting right next to you. The Holy Spirit is all around us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've gotten to a dark place in your heart, you've kind of drifted away, you've, you've allowed anxiety to be your king or bitterness to rule your heart, stop looking down. Look up. Don't be afraid. See Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to hug you. He wants to embrace you. He wants you to know that he loves you. And brothers and sisters, my friends, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, today is the day. God wants to forgive you. Are you going to tell him no? He wants to be Lord of your life, and he died for you, and he'll lead you. Are you going to say you don't want that? He wants to accept you just as you are. He wants to lift you up out of the mud. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes to Jesus. Don't push him away. Jesus didn't come for self-righteous people who think they're perfect. He came for people like me and you. Broken people, messed up people. Open your heart. Open your heart. He loves you. Open your heart. He cares for you. Open your heart. Heaven's doors are wide open. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that can hold you back except the attitude of your own heart if you want to push him back. You can trust Jesus, and you know that because he, he died for you. And then he rose again in glory. Right now, we're going to pray. If you've been living apart from Jesus Christ, you, you're a believer, but he's, you haven't been given him the priority you should. Do it now. And if you've been trying to keep him at arm's length, ask yourself, what am I doing that for? And we'll pray about that. And today is the day of salvation. And I want to invite everybody who's watching on television, you can pray right now where you're at. Just stop what you're doing. If you're watching on the Internet, just pray with me right now. And we will be together in paradise. And you will be one family with the people of God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, here we are. Father, we confess our sins. Lord, we know, we see our brokenness. We see this as a messed up and broken world. We're not going to make excuses for it. And we're not going to fight with you anymore. Because you're good and you love us and there's no reason to. So Father, we acknowledge your ways are better than our ways. Please forgive us. Please come into our lives. We want you to guide us and lead us. You're such a good king. We want to live our lives for you. We want to follow you wherever we go. We want to do whatever you ask for us, Lord. Father, please uh, send your Holy Spirit into our lives. We want to live new lives of faith in you. Teach us what it means to be your children. And help us, Lord God, to love you. And help us to love other people 
enough to tell them about the cross where Jesus died for their sins, enough to tell them that God loves them and will forgive them. Father, help us live lives that are pleasing to you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.